Thank you very much. I'm delighted to follow after our keynote speakers from Miami, Florida. I'm sorry I don't have any thinness routines to offer to you, but I'll do my best with food for the intellect. I've recently arrived in this part of the world from Australia, and I bring you greetings from as far away as you can go while still remaining on the same planet with Scandinavia. Though we sometimes doubt that. Yes, we do have kangaroos in Australia. Yes, we do have eucalyptus trees. And yes, we do have sexism. Those of you who follow the politics of governments uh, may know that between 2010 and 2013, we had the first woman prime minister in Australia. And regrettably, instead of general recognition and uh, pleasure at this sign of Australia's social progress, Julia Gillard encountered a torrent of abuse from the political right, much of it misogynist and some of it highly sexualized. Since uh, last year, we've had a new government in Australia, a free market right-wing government, led by a hyper-masculine prime minister, male this time, who, as soon as he reached power, announced that Australia was now open for business. It seems open for every kind of business except women's business, because out of the 19 members of his new cabinet, one was a woman. I think actually what has happened in Australia is a sign of something new happening in the world, which is also present in other parts of the world, but perhaps we need to think differently about it. On my way here, I flew over South China. So I was flying over the largest concentration of clothing factories in the world. And I guess if people around the room, around this arena, uh, looked at their clothing, many people would find a Made in China tag on what we are wearing now. Clothing is traditionally made by women's skills, women's skilled hands, the part of the body uh, involved. And that is still the case in S South China, where most of the manufacturing workforce is women. But of course, women's work has been relocated in the new global economy to low-wage countries like China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia. And it's also been placed under new management. No longer the management, the traditional patriarchal management of husbands, but the new patriarchal management of executives in transnational corporations, the new global ruling class. And that's really the key point that I want to, you to think about, I want to ask you to think about now. Because I have increasingly come to believe that we are in a moment of history where we're seeing a new kind of patriarchy emerging. The history of gender relations is not a single straight line from an old traditional patriarchy to a new bright future of equality. It does involve reversals. It can go backwards, as we have seen in Australia. And I think that is also happening on a world scale. We are facing what I think of as a new market patriarchy. And in that case, we need to rethink feminist strategies accordingly. Feminism has always been about bodies, always about gendered bodies in social relations. And it's really astonishing when you think of gender that way, to think of the number of ways in which our gendered bodies are being globalized, are being caught up in an international economy of a new kind. So when we think of things impinging on our bodies from outside, we see that first of all with the clothing business itself, one of our most important ways of symbolizing gender to the world. We see it in the imagery of women's bodies that young women and girls encounter as they grow up, which is increasingly shaped 
by global media, which have a common image of the desirable woman's body, thin, sexy, and white, which we come across in media from Japan to South Africa to Australia to Skorna. We also see a globalization of relations between bodies. I won't talk about sexuality because that is on our agenda from other speakers, but I want to mention the importance of care relationships between bodies and how caring for children, for older people, is also becoming part of a global industry involving the migration principally of women workers and what feminists have come to call care chains. So for instance, the Philippine, the Philippines, a poor country in Southeast Asia, which has literally millions of women workers gone abroad to do care work overseas, leaving children who have to be cared for principally by other women, relatives, grandmothers, and so forth, at home. So you get a global care chain mixed up with new forms of global industry. We're also seeing new patterns of violence associated with the new global economy. I've, for some years, been involved with a solidarity group concerned with what Mexican feminists call the femicide in Ciudad Juarez, a city in northern Mexico, where there's been a whole series of truly horrible murders of women. That can easily be misinterpreted as a case of traditional masculinity, traditional patriarchy, but it's not. Juarez is a postmodern city. It's deeply involved in the new economy of global trade, export manufacturing through maquiladora factories, and that's the context in which a new and particularly horrible form of violence against women has arisen. And strikingly, it's not only what's outside our bodies and between our bodies that is being globalized, it's also what's inside our bodies. Okay, cooking is the traditional women's work and a traditional form of care. But what we cook, what we buy from the supermarket is increasingly supplied by transnational corporations. Increasingly, with all the environmental consequences of, of agricultural monoculture, genetically modified organisms, and so forth. So across a whole range of aspects of our bodily existence, we are increasingly caught up in a new global market economy in which new powers are active. And that's what we really have to get to grips with as feminists, as thinking, thinkers, about gender politics on a world scale. I think we are actually in the presence of a new pattern of patriarchy, just defining patriarchy conventionally as institutionalized power of men in a, a system of gender relations. The core of the new form of patriarchy is in the dominant economic organizations of our day that is transnational management, that the managements of transnational corporations and the operators in transnational global markets in commodities and finance. It's a striking fact that of the 500 largest corporations in the world, only 4% have a woman as chief executive officer, as top manager. That's the way the figure is usually put, and there's often a bit of a celebration that it was 2% <laughs> five years ago, so we're obviously improving at a great rate. But the reality is that is 96% men. That is a deeply masculinized environment, competitive, ruthless, all of that. And those few sociologists who penetrated into that world have come back with reports of a very powerfully masculinized environment where the few women who get there have to manage like a man. It's one of the problems with the conventional equal opportunity strategy. The social pressures at that level of the global economy massively determine the kind of behavior that you get from executives. And transnational management 
I mean, it's not disembodied. It has a presence, a bodily presence, in the form of an elite group of managers who travel constantly, who form, in effect, an offshore power center of a kind that our traditional political models don't really yet understand. Their work is dependent on the alliance they've been able to make with a new kind of state elite in market-friendly states, whether authoritarian or liberal, both exist, and both from the point of view of the corporate managers are their friends. So we have the impact of a new global power structure in the restructuring of economies in the global north, to some extent, but most powerfully in the global south, in the dismantling of developmental states in the global south, and the creation of e economy of extractivism, which we see, for instance, in Australia at the moment, as well as in poor parts of the global south, like Africa. And with this emerging power structure, this new pattern of economics and political power, I think many of the social movements which have been responsible for gains in social justice, including gender justice in the past, have in effect been outflanked by the new development of patriarchal power. I think that has happened to a large extent with the labor movement, in which I have a long history, and I think it is also happening with feminism. So it is up to us to think of new political strategies that might be adequate to this new scene we find ourselves in. Now, this will be a subject of a great deal of debate at the whole forum. I want to feed in just three points, three suggestions as, as my contribution to the discussion. First, it's immensely important that people from rich countries, whether in the global south or in the, in the, in the far south or in the global north, should be prepared to learn from the developing world, to learn from feminisms in the global south, and not to think that global politics simply means exporting models from rich countries to poor countries. The global south is in fact a rich source Thank you. The Global South is a rich source of feminist theory as well as feminist practice. And I'll just mention one important thinker, Amina Mama, a leading feminist thinker from Africa, who has developed an important analysis of gender violence that connects it with the violence of colonialism and the impact of colonization and imperialism on the gender orders of, of societies in the global south. The second kind of strategy that we need to develop is strategies that are able to contest the effects of the market and sometimes indeed the creation of the market since neoliberalism is constantly inventing new markets. We need to contest the precariousness of life on which market power constantly trades by assertions of women's land rights, a major issue in many parts of the South, nutrition guarantees, since the fear of starvation is an important uh, issue, and income guarantees on whatever you know, minimal level is practicable. The more we can institutionalize such guarantees, the better. And finally, we need to give new energy, I think, to solidarity politics. That is, to the kind of politics in which we, people who live in rich and privileged countries, are responding to the needs articulated by social movements and feminist movements in the global south, kind of politics which has long existed, but which needs now, I think, to become the center of global, of global feminism. So I'm very glad to be with you to share these ideas. I think the Nordisk Forum is a great idea. I've been fascinated by the way it's worked. I think we in Australia can learn from it. And I hope that what I've suggested, what I've thrown in, will help you in thinking feminist re re regeneration, feminist renewal on a world scale. Thank you.